Good morning, everybody. It is great to see all of you. It feels like we're overflowing this morning. Uh, I know all of you know it here, but for those at home, I want to welcome you that are here and you that are at home. Um, John Hudson, I'm the pastor here at Pilgrim Church, United Church of Christ at 25 South Main Street in Sherburne, Massachusetts, and it really is a great pleasure to be face-to-face and heart-to-heart with people. Um, you know, mo- some of you know I, I just finished a big road trip. I, I did 3,900 miles, 19 days, 17 states, six stops. And the funny thing is, I, I mostly went to see people that I have not seen in two years. And uh, I have to say... Um, one of the nicest things was seeing two of my God kids in um, Minneapolis, but it was so kind of bittersweet to see my 13-year-old goddaughter and that I had missed those two years. Do you know what I mean? And so uh, it's interesting. I think that it's reminded me of a couple of things, that even if we haven't lost anyone directly to COVID, in a way, we've all been affected by it. We have, we've experienced loss a loss of community and not seeing our grandkids or having trouble seeing our our older parents. Um, And yet, I don't know, on the opposite side of that, we've been reminded of what a gift it is to just be with people. You know, it's like a miracle now, right? I mean, if you've gone to any kind of outside event this summer, like a concert or just a barbecue, it's, it's amazing. You know, God creates us to be in community. And it's funny, in my sermon, which is about uh, language and speaking or not speaking today, I'm going to talk about all the different ways we can communicate. But finally, there really is no substitute for being face-to-face with someone. Um, But if we have to Zoom, we'll Zoom. If we have to text, we'll text. If we have to go over Facebook, we will do that. We're just so glad that people can connect with us in all different kinds of ways. But I just want to welcome you to community this morning and to being with and for each other. It's absolutely wonderful to see you. I have two announcements. I'm really happy to report. Um, Some of you might know the state of Massachusetts right now is connecting vaccine agencies with local houses of worship 
to promote getting vaccines. I heard about it when I was on my road trip, so I got in touch with them. And so we are partnering with a healthcare agency in Framingham, and we're going to have a vaccine clinic here on Wednesday, September 8th from noon to 4. It's for people who haven't gotten the vaccine yet. It's all about really outreach. I'll be posting the link. People will be able to sign up online. They'll also come back in six weeks to get their second shot. And so I assume that most of you have had the shot. Um, if you haven't, please come that day if you have. But if you have people in your life who still, for whatever reason, haven't gotten the shot, I would ask you to kind of invite them to be a part of our outreach that day. Um, I think it's important for our church to be working for the common good. And so we'll be doing that. You get more information about it. And also, I just wanted to remind us, we have a, a class with our brothers and sisters at Bethel AME in Boston, the largest black church in the city. We've become really much closer to them this year. Uh, we'll be doing a class on Thursday nights. We'll be reading together the 1619 Project, which is a Pulitzer Prize winning article about uh, kind of viewing history through a different lens. Um, and actually, I'm just excited to report we're going to be doing that class. We're going to have another writing class, and we're going to be doing a hands-on social justice project with Bethel in the fall in the city, and you'll be getting more information about that. Um, and so um, to your comfort level, I would invite you to turn to your left, right, back, or front, and wave, thumbs up, or whatever. And if you're new or if you don't know people, please introduce yourselves to your pew mates and for those who are here. Hi, Jim. Uh, for those of you who are at home, say hello to your family. Um, and Jim, please take us into the next part of worship. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you. My name is Jim Hartman, and uh, my family and I have been members of this church now for some 20 years. I guess not all of us, since we had our kids born here. So some have been here for part of 20 years, but... Um, it's my honor to uh, help this morning. Um, I canceled the Wall Street Journal. I love the newspaper. I'm a newspaper reader. And I just, the summer, I just couldn't take the news. I was just tired of reading the same stories. And it's over and over. And I, so I called Wall Street and said, you know what? I can't do it. And they said, that's fine. That happens. Content burnout. So this morning, I didn't have my newspaper. So I flipped on Good Morning America and, uh, or something on TV. And it was Good Morning America. And there are three lead stories were just, you know, Afghanistan and COVID. And I thought, you know, I have to shut the TV off now. Um, uh, it's good to get the news, but it reminded me, Pastor John sent me a podcast this summer, and uh, the basis of the podcast was that it's, you know, it's a 3D world, and we're, we're sometimes caught looking just right and left at all the stuff that's coming at us, and we fail to look up, you know, towards God and towards the heavens and prayer and all these different things. And it struck me at a good time when it's like, yeah, I need to stop looking at the stuff that's coming at me sideways. Uh, of course, the problem is during the week, it's too much going on. You just get caught with all the stuff that's coming at you. Um, but I encourage you today to take this one hour and maybe kind of drop the stuff that's firing at you from all directions. Focus upward, um, and that's what we get with this beauty of one hour in church at Pilgrim. So with that, I welcome you today. Uh, our opening um, call to worship is come, comes from the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. I'll be reading it. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Thank mm -hmm.
Please be seated. And yes, it's hard to sing a hymn with a mask on, and yet we get to sing together. So um, one thing I have to say that um, was wonderful about my trip, I don't know if you like to travel by car, but um, it reminded me of what a beautiful country we live in. There's a lot of beautiful people and amazing sights, different cultures and customs. I'm thinking about what Jim said, you know, on the one hand, you could get caught up in the negative news and think we're falling apart, but on the other hand, when you do face-to-face -face stuff, it really is a beautiful place with wonderful people, and it all depends on where you look. And so what I want us to do this day as we kind of come together for a time of confession is to think about where in our life do we need to look for the good? Where do we need to recognize goodness and kindness and love and grace and generosity? Because I guarantee you, my friends, it is there. But sometimes we get a little down, we get a little weighted, and we don't see it. So let's take a moment to think about our lives and, and to remind ourselves where God's good and the good is. So let's be in a quiet place of prayer. God, this day, fill us up with your spirit that we might see goodness and the good. That even where we see things that are hard or bad or frustrating, give us the strength, God, to bring a positive energy to that, to work for your goodness, to see your goodness, to thank you for goodness, and then to share that goodness with others. Open our eyes and open our hearts this day, God. And all these things we we ask for you in confidence, we confess to you in humility, and we come to you confident of your forgiveness and love that we're always reconciled back unto you. And all of these things we ask in the name of your Son, our Redeemer, our friend, our teacher, uh, the carpenter's child, who invites us all to pray together as a sign of our unity in him, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning is taken from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. How great a forest is set ablaze by the small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among the members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, it sets on fire the cycle of nature, and it and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and the Father, and with it we curse those were made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. May God bless our understanding. Let's all be in a spirit of prayer together. Let us pray. 
God, as we come together this day to think about what it means for us as your people to know when to speak and to know when to be silent, fill us with your wisdom, fill us with openness to your word and curiosity to your word about how it might speak to our lives and the life of this world. And God, let your word be alive in our hearts, in this community and church, and in your creation. Amen. And again, from that text, with our tongue, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Almost as, the, as soon as the so-called joke left my mouth, I knew I just knew that I had used the God-given gift of language and the God-given gift of my tongue to deeply hurt another human being. And oh, how I wish I had just kept my mouth shut and been silent. It was the day after a wedding I performed in Rhode Island, a service that for the most part went very well, but that featured one big glitch. Members of the bride's family showed up for the Friday night rehearsal almost a half hour late. So now in worship on Sunday, as I riffed at the beginning of my welcome, as you've seen me do, I decided to spontaneously make up a joke about that tardy family, a casual, and I have to admit caustic aside about them, as in the jokes on you. Whatever I said, and I don't remember it, it got a little titter from the congregation, but just as I laughed to join in, I looked out into the church, and I saw that same bride and her new husband sitting in the pews. She now looking up at me with a pained expression of surprise and hurt and even shame. I think and I know it is about the absolute worst I have ever felt about something I said about and to another fellow child of God. It was one of the stupidest and most unthinking things I've ever done as a pastor. And it taught me the golden rule of joke making, and not just from the pulpit, but in any setting. If you are going to use your words to make a ha-ha or a witty observation to get folks to laugh, always, always make the joke on yourself. Now, I'm relieved to report that the couple, with great grace, forgave me after I profusely apologized to them at coffee hour and they even had me baptize their new baby a few years later. But boy, did I learn a lesson about language, about the power of the human tongue to wound another, and about the need for me to think first, to always think first before speaking, to think about how what I say will be received by someone else, to think about whether it will cut or whether it will heal whether the words are kind or cruel, are designed to make me look good and another the goat, or if my words build someone else up and make them feel loved. The writer of the letter of James is right in what he wrote about the tongue and human language. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire and the tongue is a fire. Friends, the tongue is potentially a fire, ever ready to set ablaze a relationship, a community, a church, the world, all by what each of us chooses to say or by what each of us chooses not to say. Another valuable lesson about human language and the tongue I learned was from a friend of mine in Alcoholics Anonymous. In one of his first meetings, when the topic was taking care in how we speak about ourselves and others as a part of recovery from alcohol, a wise soul offered this three-part formula to decide whether in any situation to speak or to keep silence. So this is what they said. When you are tempted to offer a critique or an opinion about another person or event or politics or whatever, first ask yourself three questions. Does it need to be said? Does it need to be said now? And do I need to be the one to say it? Do you hear that? 
Does it need to be said? Does it need to be said now? And do I need to be the one to say it? Friends, imagine how much better life would be in church and families and politics and all social settings and relationships if we just stopped before we spoke and asked ourselves and then answered those three simple questions. Imagine how wonderful life would be if each of us, if all of us, knew just when to talk and when to not talk, to be silent, when to opine and when to keep our mouths closed, when to speak up and speak out, and when to remember that sometimes silence is, in fact, golden. This morning, we return to our summer preaching series about the seasons of life in God's world and knowing when it is the right season to make peace or war, to build up or tear down, to laugh or to cry, and as the author of Ecclesiastes writes, there is a time to speak and there is a time to keep silence. When is it good and right and godly to open our mouths and use language as a tool for goodness? And when it is good and right and godly to be mute, wordless, in this work for the good, to make things better? Talk or tame our tongues, converse or calmly keep quiet. When have you been in some situation and said something that you totally regretted? or said some words that cut like a knife, or offered some observation that made things worse, or you stereotyped another child of God. I mean, I think of like the time in my childhood when in anger and teenage impetuousness, I actually said to my mom or dad, I hate you. Oh my God, what was I thinking? Or the time someone called me, and I'm just gonna use this word, a faggot, in middle school, the cruelest put-down of all in that male adolescent world. I wanted to die, just crawl into a hole and go away. Or the times I've been in a social situation when someone says something just plain racist or sexist or homophobic or mean, and I remain silent because I'm afraid to confront them or to call them out to stand up against the sin of using human words, the tongue to do verbal violence to another because of their skin color or who they choose to love or the fact that they are a woman or the God that they choose to worship. Friends, we are living in strange and fraught times for words and language and the power, not just of the tongue and the power of the pen, but also the power of the text message and email and Facebook comments, and Twitter tirades, and the power of the media as well, radio and TV, so many ways to communicate. I'd say almost too many ways to speak. There was a time not long ago that if you had something to say to someone, you had to do it face to face, or perhaps over the phone. And so we had to at least be thoughtful and try to be sure about what we wanted to say and how we wanted to say it. But in 2021, I mean, just consider the smartphone. 3.8 million people worldwide own one. The average user sends and receives 41 text messages per day. Boomers and millennials spend on average six hours per day on their phones. And the average teenager user sends and receives upwards of 100 texts per day, often many more. And of course, the pandemic has forced many of us to move even further away from direct contact with others for safety reasons. So when the author of James wrote his letter to the church 2,000 years ago, folks communicated in just, way for the most, in just one way for the most part, face-to-face, -face, verbally spoken speech. Most average folks then were not literate. They could not read nor write. And so almost all communication was direct, and one-to-one, -one, or perhaps a speech in the public square, or maybe a sermon at Temple. I think if a person from James's time landed in 2021, they'd have a complete and total nervous breakdown when confronted with so many differing and multiple ways to talk. And yet, I think James's warning about the power of the tongue and human language is just as relevant now as then. As that author observes, the very same tongue that we use to bless and speak to God is the same tongue 
that we use to curse a person created in the image of that very same God. And so translation, at least for me, is words matter. Our words matter. How we use them as a weapon or how we use them to bless and love others and ourselves. Words in any form of communication connect us one to another as children of God and as families and as fellow citizens and as inhabitants of God's creation. And so what matters most, it seems to me, is how we choose to use the tongue or not in all of its forms, verbal, written, texted, emailed, whatever. Friends, I don't think we can overestimate the power of the tongue. A leader who leads well in this world in word and speech can inspire a people to come together to work in unison for the common good. And a leader who leads selfishly, who leads to hurt and shame and bully and embarrass others for personal power can take a nation down as a whole and damage community. A parent's words can largely shape how a child sees themselves and hurt just as much as a physical assault, can lift up a son or a daughter in a way that lets them soar in this life. A spouse can be supportive and loving with just a few words over the breakfast table or in the car, or in a few words can break that other person's heart. A preacher, as I found out and am still learning, can teach and challenge believers to be their very best and to do their best and to love God or religious leaders can also inspire their followers to hate or to discriminate or to not take the vaccine or to reject folks of other faiths or folks of differing sexual orientations. Words matter. These are a gift from God, but finally the tongue and language are just tools. They're neutral in a way until each of us decides how we will speak when we open our mouths or text on our phones or zoom on our screens, words matter. So it seems to me that our job as people of faith and followers of Jesus Christ, he who literally saves lives and saves the world through the power of his words. Friends, we are called to be wise and humble and discerning and compassionate and loving in the words that we choose to speak and write and share with each other. I'm curious if you all have any personal guidelines or boundaries that you use when communicating in this life. Actually, I'm going to step down and we're going to have a discussion, but I ask you to think about it. So here's a couple that I've kind of tried to stick to in life. The first is, I remember what my mom often said, if you don't have something nice to say, just don't say it. I remember how wounded I was as a kid by the words my peers sometimes spoke to me, bullied me. Friends, that memory still shapes how I speak to others, especially the vulnerable and the innocent. I try to be prudent when it comes to difficult conversations. When I need to speak to someone about how their words are perhaps hurting me or others or making a bad situation worse, I will often write something and then sit on it for a day and then reread it, and then maybe not send it at all. I always try and speak face to face and directly, especially if I have something important or perhaps complicated or sensitive to discuss. Yes, the tongue is a fire. It can burn or it can bless. It challenges us to know when to speak and when to keep silence, when to react and when to cool down, when to use our words in love, in love. So may God help us all to know that words matter. They matter, both the spoken and the unspoken. Let all God's people say, Amen. And Sam, if I could ask you to come forward and give me a hand. And Doug, if you could turn up the microphone. So, wait a second. now is the time when I ask you for some feedback, um, if uh, ideas, response to this. Do you have any guidelines for language that I missed uh, that kind of guide you? What do you think about all this stuff around the tongue and language and speaking? 
or not speaking, especially as people of faith. Anyone? I think the important thing is if you do say something that hurts somebody, to apologize. I mean, we're human, we're going to make errors, but if you apologize and say you're sorry, I think that goes a long way. So Jane was just making the point that um, just like you can speak bad words, you can also immediately follow it up with an apology and to ask for forgiveness. So thanks, Jane. Other thoughts or ideas? Just remember to mind your manners and be civil in all circumstances. I love beautiful manners, and whenever we see it, it brings a smile to our hearts. So the idea of kind of mind your manners and remember civility, I always remember a quote, I'm not sure who said it, but that civility is the glue that holds together civilization. You know, we wouldn't think it's that important, but actually it's incredibly important, especially when we're among strangers or people we don't know that well. Linda. Uh, just to follow up uh, what was said of apologizing if you've hurt someone's feelings, I think it's also important if your feelings are hurt to let that other person know because sometimes I think people will just hold it in and then just get angry and, and um, not share with that other person how the words made him or her feel. So if you could sort of kindly say, you know, well, that really hurt my feelings, maybe it's also a good learning opportunity for that person to know. Gee, maybe what I said wasn't all that, all that kind. And actually, as you said, I think sometimes I've appreciated it when people have said to me, I don't think you realized it, that when you said that, it hurt me or it could be easily misunderstood. You know, it's almost like loving someone and respecting them enough to be able to be honest with them and to speak the truth in love. So, other ideas or thoughts? Uh, Jim. Well, I think this, uh, the times that, that uh, cause me to think, should I speak or stay silent, are in meetings. And I think that uh, our society really depends, and, and good meetings depend on doing both, not exclusively being silent and letting things go on that you disagree with or agree with, but speaking up, but then also spending at least an equal amount of time of listening. So I have to say, one of the rules, I forgot to put it in my sermon is, I've just noticed sometimes at meetings, because I'm a man, I just keep talk, 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 talking. And then sometimes I will actually see in a meeting a woman who's been trying to speak but who hasn't been recognized. And it's just funny. I, I have to admit I didn't think about this for years, and now I just pay attention in meetings. Or it might be like a younger member of the, of the meeting, or it might be someone who's introverted and just needs space to think about things. So. At least when I run meetings or participate in them, I just try to remember that after a while, people don't need to hear my opinion anymore. So, any other ideas or thoughts? That was fun. And I hope this discussion will continue at Coffee Hour, which is going to be hosted by Jim and his family out on the uh, patio. We can all take off our masks and if we feel called to and be with each other. So this is now the time that we do kind of corporate or communal prayer. For those who are at home, um, if you want to kind of type out some prayers. And for those who are here, do you have any prayers, concerns, joys? that you would like to lift up this day? Anyone? Okay, I have several. I want to pray for our friends and brothers and sisters in Louisiana. Very scary this morning. And 
kind of weirdly ironic, I'm sure you've heard, it's the 16th anniversary of Katrina. And, you know, Peter and I led groups for years down there, rebuilding, and it's, it's overwhelming how much damage a hurricane can do. So let's just pray for safety, and maybe it'll veer off more or weaken. Just pray for them. Um, I also want to pray for those who are in Afghanistan, for the soldiers who are acting bravely and putting their lives on the line to protect people, in particular um, innocent people or people who are threatened, men and women and children, uh, people who helped our cause there for 20 years, um, and um, pray for peace. And also pray for, uh, I need to say this, of a world where religions don't necessarily have to agree, but where they live in peace and harmony with each other. I love religion, I do it for a living, but sometimes we can kind of be nasty to each other. In particular, we can be nasty to other religions. And I just hope we continue to learn that lesson over and over. Peter, a prayer. Pray that the uh, march in Washington for voting rights is peaceful and effective. Thanks, Peter. Um, I want to also offer prayers um, for the kids that are going back to school, for the college kids that are going back to school, for the teachers, it's just, it's not going to be easy again. I mean, being a teacher is hard enough and being a student is hard enough, but I think that all of us have felt a little whipsawed this summer. Just when we were dancing in the streets, we had to put our masks back on, so it's just, it's hard. And I also pray that folks would respect each other when it comes to their decisions whether or not to wear a mask and to get a vaccine even. Um, so, and pray for anybody in this church who's hurting or if they're in the nursing home or if they're lonely or if they just need a connection. Um, and deep thanksgiving for every single one of you who are here today. So, um, let's be in a spirit of prayer together. Let us pray. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the gift this day of, of the tongue and of language, of the power that is to be found for the good in speaking, in writing, in texting, in communicating. But God, always remind us the responsibility that goes along with communication. Help us to embody Christ's love and compassion in how we speak and in when we speak. Give us wisdom, God, to know when to just say nothing, to not comment, to not snap back, but also give us wisdom to know and courage to know when to speak up, when to defend the powerless and speak for the voiceless, when to call out meanness and hatred and stereotypes. Remind us, God, that words matter. They're not just letters on a page or sounds in the air. They can bless or they can curse. Help us to be wise and discerning in all the ways that we use language in our tongues and now in the quiet places of our hearts we offer our personal prayers, our personal joys, our personal concerns to you this day. All of these things and so much more we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I don't know if you read in the Globe today, one of the soldiers who was killed in Afghanistan was a young woman from Lawrence, Massachusetts. It was a picture of her, actually. It was a beautiful picture. She was smiling. She was in her uniform. And clearly, she felt called to serve other people. 
you know, there's a power in this life when we are asked to serve in whatever way possible, and we say yes. One of the things about our Christian faith is it's active. It's about yes. It's about service. It's about seeking. It's about acting. It's about living. It's not just words on a page. And so I hope that all of the examples we have in our life of service to others, not just soldiers, but nurses and doctors and teachers, that we would let that inspire us just as the life of Christ and the ways he served us does. And so in that spirit of service, of supporting a cause greater than ourselves, the church's ministries here and in the world, I would invite you to participate in this morning's offering.
Dear God, we come to you, gracious Lord, with a heartfelt thanks for all you have provided in our lives. We are truly blessed. Help us to keep our focus on you as we transition from summer to fall, remembering you travel with us. Please accept these our gifts of thanks to spread your word through your world. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I want to ask uh, Sam to hand out um, our contact tracing sheets of paper. I don't know if you got one when you came into church, but especially now, we really need to just keep track of everybody who's here on Sunday morning, so please raise your hand if you'd like one of those sheets, and then I ask you to fill it out. Uh, um, he's also, they've also got pencils if you need it. There's pencils in the pews, too and then put it in the basket at the back of the church as you exit. Especially now, it's important for us to just know who's in church every single Sunday. 
Um, and also, I'd offer before the benediction that um, it would be wonderful to see everybody outside um, to talk and to fellowship and to eat what looks like an amazingly delicious food offered by the Hartman family. And um, so we will all meet out there after the benediction. So let's join together in a final spirit of prayer. God, send us forth aware that words matter, that how we speak or the times when we choose not to speak make a big difference. Help us to honor you by what we say, by how we say it, and by how we use our words to build up others and to embody your unconditional love. And all this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Let all God's people say, Amen.